Galloway's support through sight loss. Galloway's get active. Welcome to the get active uh, today. I'd like to welcome Mike and Adam from Lancashire Wildlife Trust. Um, they are here to talk to us about the my place. I always want to say my space, but it's my place in terms. So, yeah. uh, over to be more relevant Mike than my space. They can tell us a bit more about it. Well, thanks for the invite, James, and hello everybody. Thanks for for coming along. Oh. Am, I, am I on mute there? No, I can hear you, Mike. Cool. Um, so, I'm um, just. To, are, you, are you guys all normally part of? Um, James's walking group is really getting a bit of a kind of background yeah. to, to a number of those, obviously pre-COVID. Pre um, so yeah, obviously um, myself and James has chatted quite a lot. He has the massive misfortune to be my neighbour. And um, we've got a situation where if we've got tents in our garden, we don't look at each other strange because we've both got a similar passion, I think, for, for the natural world. Um, obviously um, for the Wildlife Trust, for us, um, We've got, you know, 50, 50 wildlife sites throughout kind of Lancashire, North Merseyside, Greater Manchester. Some of them are quite large, but most of them are tiny little pockets of um, wilderness tucked away on our doorsteps that we don't really know about. Um, but for years and years and years, we've, we've known what personally and as an organisation, uh, the real benefit that the natural world can, can have on your kind of well-being and how you feel and improved um, mental health. And what happened excitingly five years ago was um, the NHS also kind of um, started to realise that and there's been a massive body of evidence now to kind of back up what we've been saying about how nature can boost um, your well-being and five years ago we went into partnership with um, Lancashire and South Cumbria Foundation Trust NHS um, and it's been a really great journey I mean we've We've got sessions all across the region. I think we've got 14 hub sites across Lancashire. Um, most of our kind of green, we call it kind of green well-being or sometimes referred to as ecotherapy. Um, but so our green well-being offer is really for those who could be struggling with poor well-being, with being anxious, with being isolated, um, or just struggling, to, you know, social anxiety, struggling to get out of the house. Um, Usually in the old world would have been out and about at some of our reserves um, doing activities which link into the five ways to well-being, which Adam's going to talk about in a little while. Um, but obviously post-COVID, we've moved our offer online. So for the last um, the last while, we've been doing similar to this, we've been doing online sessions via Zoom, but still connected with people in their homes and using the natural the natural world to help people's well-being. So um, if I just hand over to, I'm not too sure if you all know about the five ways, so I'll just hand over to Adam, um, you can run through those with you. And as I say, all our all of our activities um, link into these five ways, and I'll explain more about that later on, but I'll just hand over to Adam just now. All right, afternoon everybody, nice to meet you. Um, my name's Adam, and my hub, uh, those sites that Mike mentioned, my hub is over in Bolton, Greater Manchester. Um, so yeah, the kind of the, the five ways that we've uh, we've just mentioned um, are based on a report that came out by the New Economics Foundation if, a number of years ago. Uh, it's all evidence based as well. So this is kind of gathering data about what helps improve our well-being, kind of physical and and mental uh, well-being. Um, and they're based on five key concepts, basically. Uh, those concepts uh, being uh, connecting. being active, taking notice, giving, and learning. And if you can incorporate those five aspects into your into your lives on a daily and weekly basis, um, it's shown that it's it's meant to kind of, uh, it helps improve your mental well-being, you know, over time uh, and quite, quite quickly as well. Um, so it's a really easy kind of concept, isn't it? Five ways, if you can think about five things you can do on a regular basis. Uh, it's a really good, it's a really good, good system and that's what we hang our um our sessions on is those five ways that we can do f those five things in our sessions using our own little uh our methods uh, then it shows improvement in well-being um just to give you some ex quick examples of 
you know, how you can do these five things. Uh, an example of uh, connecting would be maybe picking up the phone or having a Zoom meeting like this instead of sending an email, um, which can be a little bit impersonal. Um, so that's a nice, easy way of doing something, connecting on a different way with somebody, uh, maybe stopping and chatting with somebody for a little bit, asking how the day was and spending that time actually listening to that person. Because um, I think a lot, a lot of times our communication can be you know, we look, it feels like it's two way, but it's actually one way. We're just waiting for our, for our own turn to speak, but actually really listening to someone is a really good way of connecting. Um, being active is fairly self-explanatory there. I think is maybe something like if you have the choice of taking stairs instead of the lift or going out for a walk when you have the opportunity to, um, changing the way that you uh, travel in terms of public transport, maybe getting off a little bit early if you're able to and walking. Um, or organizing a, a, a an active activity an outdoor activity so the walking group for example that you guys are um, part of so that's a, a nice easy obvious way of, of getting the the active way into your uh, lives uh, taking notice for example so um, maybe just looking at uh, ways of of changing the, the the things in your kind of maybe in your own environment like uh, at um, your workspace or in your living room um, something like that where you can change you know, add a plant you can change the de decor you can clear the clutter from your kind of daily space and that changes things around it helps you know uh, see the space in a different way and and um, it makes it feel different as well you could take a different route to work um, or to uh, wherever else you travel on a, on a regular basis. Or if you fancy having lunch in a different spot, you can go to a new spot for lunch, something like that. Uh, uh, giving, I think, is also um, fairly self-explanatory. So it's just maybe kind of giving your time uh, to a friend, family, a group like this uh, and contributing in that way is quite helpful as well. And then finally, uh, learning. So... I think that's also fairly obvious as well. So maybe doing something like um, puzzles uh, or uh, a bit more reading, uh, maybe chatting to colleagues about something they're working with or friends that, you know, finding out if they're getting into a new hobby or new activity and maybe looking at learning a bit about that or signing up for a class or something like that. Um, so those are really simple ways of, of getting the five ways to well-being into as to where oh. we're at. Well, thanks, Adam. I think um, I've frozen a little bit there. My connection's not so good, so I hope you caught that. No, that's great. Thanks, mate. Um, yeah, so the, the basics of that report actually um, said that if you practice these every day and it's being mindful and being aware that you're actually undertaking them rather than just doing them, it actually will add seven and a half years of, to your life expectancy. So um, it's well worth doing it. So Linking in what Adam's just said, our, our main themes that we do on a session, as I say, um, sessions are um, really small, friendly groups, so it's inclusive to everybody. Everybody's welcome, so um, again, we can discuss later on about ways to get involved. We kind of share our kind of challenges and positives, any wildlife highlights, but we kind of, our themes of uh, what we call ecotherapy are basically um, practical conservation, so that's being active, um, maybe planting some trees or um, pull up some invasive species or improving the habitat for, you know, for various wildlife. It could be something to do with bushcraft. So that's every day is a school day, keep learning, something um, that Adam's just mentioned. Nature walks is one of our themes. Uh, again, very similar to what James is doing with you guys already, being active. Uh, we do quite a lot of growing projects. So some of our sites are... Um, based up community allotments and various other things. And again, growing produce, not only to use for ourselves, but we give to other people. Um, so that links into those kind of things. And the, the last one is, um, is mindfulness. And sometimes people get a little bit, um, a little bit worried about mindfulness. We think we're all going to be tree huggers and we're going to be doing meditation in, in the woods and this kind of thing. Yeah. And actually all that mindfulness is, is really in, in very basic terms, is giving your giving your brain chance to kind of slow down in this modern life that we um, find ourselves in. Um, we don't get chance to engage what's called our slow brain. So our emails are always pinging, doorbells are always going, 
information, information, information. And our brains are designed, although in the past it was a, you know, a fight or flight thing that we were able to multitask, we're able to escape from danger. It's a real benefit to humans as a race. But actually, in this day and age, it's just too much information going in there. So it's actually ways to practice kind of slowing down, taking notice and being in being in the moment. So that's really what we do with our kind of five themes um, that link into the five ways. It's all about fives so that link into the five ways of well-being. And that's whether we be on Zoom sessions or whether we be out and about. So what I was going to lead on with just now, if, if possible, is uh, if Adam struggled a little bit with his uh, internet, I'm just going to try and um, share an audio. And I don't know how obvious if you guys are all up and about with James um, previously. Hopefully, you you'll have some um, favourable attitudes towards nature. But what I want to do is just spend one one moment. If we can just imagine, we've got through the. We've got through the cold, wet winter. We're entering spring, and when we take notice, uh, it's just really engaged with um, all of our senses. I love the smell after rain showers, um, and just imagine you're going into a, a beautiful woodland, and I'm just gonna play an audio file, and if we just spend one minute, um, listening to this, hopefully you'll be able to hear it. Okay, just bear with me. I'm not the most technical minded of these. Um... How did that make people feel? Relaxed. I felt my shoulders go down, even though I'm sitting in front of a computer. Um, and this is why it's hard to describe um, the benefit nature has, but being there, it really does lend itself to, um, to kind of relaxing and being in the moment. And it's something to practice, as I say, um, I did that recently on a session with, with a group and they could almost smell like the pine needles. The one person said, I can smell pine needles. And it, that was just off the sound that was triggering that response. Um, and as I say, whether it be the frost on your face or when it, the kind of um, the warm rays of sunshine coming through, but it's just trying to take that time out to to stop that busy brain of what's going on, what's going to be uh, happening in your life just now, um, what's for tea, what's this, what's that, well, let's sort that out. And it's just giving yourself that that headspace just to kind of, as I say, if you imagine the brain's like a muscle and it's just a matter of giving that muscle a, a rest um, as you would any other muscle and kind of be in that moment. So um, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you like that. So. What we're going to do next is um, we haven't got an activity as such and just kind of, kind of um, talk about some of the things we could get involved with um, 
in the future if you if you wanted to get involved or we could maybe do some of the sessions down the line. As I say, um, recently we've been doing some bushcraft online, making some kind of um, doing some willow weaving. Uh, we've done bird feeders. I know James's got a bird feeder in his garden, um, and it's been a challenge for us to to move from being in a, um, a nature reserve setting to then trying to think what you can do at home with what you can find in the recycling box and what you can do. Um, but this time of year, some of my personal highlights I'd like to speak about is um, the first one is to listen out at the moment um, for your tawny owls. So the last couple of evenings for me um, on the back doorstep, um, I've heard tawny owls calling. They're the only owls that do the typical twit to woo. And actually that's two owls that are doing that. You've got your female, which makes the quick, the twit, it's, it's actually a quick, quick noise, but it's, it, that's the twit theoretically. And the male calls back with the hoo hoo. And at this stage, they're getting really vocal. They're getting, the, they're getting their elbows out, looking for territory. And um, they're really early egg layers. So they can lay their eggs um, in March. Um, sometimes actually you can get chicks in, in March. So for me, the next couple of weeks is a real highlight for listening out for tawnies. And another thing we've done recently on, on sessions, which I'd like to kind of share with you, is um, it's a tough time, um, you know, kind of sometimes over the festive period, um, maybe a bit isolated and a bit, um, you know, I, I don't think it helps when it starts getting colder, shortening of the days. And we started talking about another major thing that happens at this time of year, which is, which is hibernation. And I think the Sundays when it's frosty out there, we all want to kind of get under the duvet um, and do a little bit of hibernating. Um, but I've just, as I say, there was a recent, recent um, session where we kind of looked at sort of nature's ways of um, overcoming this, this cold weather. So a um, little bit of information. This hibernation is split really into, into two um, categories. There's only actually um, three species of mammal in the UK that truly that truly hibernate. Does anybody um, know what they are? Not James. <laughs> Any takers? You can unmute yourselves if you want now. Nobody knows. So we've we've got our group of. Um, flying mammals, which are our bats, so they they ha um, are the first kind of group. Then we've got hedgehogs, um, and then the last one is is, is dormice. So I don't think we've got dormice um, too close to us. Adam might be able to. Uh, there is, I think, there's a little population in Cheshire. Is that the, the yeah, nearest ones? Dormice are they? in Cheshire. Yeah, I'm not sure about Lancashire. Um, right. They're not very widespread. Um, they can't drive cars, so that, that stops them from spreading too much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Cheshire is the nearest place. So they're the three, the three mammals that actually uh, oh. hibernate. Oh. There's two. Go on, David. I, I was just laughing at that. They, they can't drive cars. I was just going to add, I was just waiting for myself to stop giggling. That's not <laughs> used with field vibes, then, because I've heard of field. <laughs> you know, you no. get that. Them, don't you? Because them are the ones that can come into your house, aren't they? When they shouldn't be. Yeah, the um, the door mice are the many fans in southern England, but they're the only ones um, that truly hibernate. So there's a bit of a bit of confusion. I'll just explain a bit about um, what hibernate hi hibernation is, because it's actually split down into two things. The first one is something called torpor, which um, is more of a short term hibernation that could almost be daily, where um, eating less, moving less, whereas actual true hibernation. As a kid, I always think of polar bears going underneath the snow for all those months. Um, but Maybe. true hibernation is um, actually a regulated state of hypothermia. So oh. there are mammals. Um, and then obviously we've got our amphibians and our reptiles that go into slow metabolism. And then the final group, um, which we could try and help at this stage of the year, is so they all need our help really to try and find somewhere snug 
somewhere cozy to spend um, the winter months. Our final um, group is our is our insects now. I need to be careful here because Adam is the insect expert in the Michael's <laughs> team, so he might completely shoot me out of the water here. Um, but if I'm true, if a, if facts get me true, it's um, something called diapores, which insects um, undertake. So the most famous one is the is the queen bee. So obviously, the sadly most of the um, the worker bees um, die, but the um, the queen bumblebee is finding little cozy places to be uh, to spend the winter. One thing you can make if you wanted to help bees out, um, we've made them on sessions in the past. Something really really simple is getting two plastic um, two plastic plant pots. Fill them with dry leaves, um, dry grasses, that kind of stuff, and having like a little tiny hose pipe coming off the side. We made them in a session once and up. Our guys got buses home, and the best way to describe it wasn't like a, a homemade bomb. <laughs> so it wasn't because it was a small like incendiary type thing with like a fuse coming out the top. You bury that under the ground, and that's a, a safe place for them to, to hide. Um, the other um, major insect groups that um, hibernate are our British butterflies. So it's really interesting actually, they, each of the butterflies cope with it in different ways. So we've got 50, 58 species in the UK. Um, nine of them overwinter as eggs, 32 overwinter as caterpillars. I was actually deadheading some of the plants in the garden the other day and I found caterpillars. Oh. Um, and then 11 overwinter as pupa and six overwinter as adults. So sometimes you get red admirals in the house um, but so something we can help by quite easily making something in, in the home um, to help our insects is a little miniature bug hotel. So that could be something like um, an old Tetra Pak orange juice bottle or a milk carton with the front cut off. And we could fill that with bits of stick or garden cane. Um, and that could be somewhere for our insects to kind of overwinter. Adam, is it true that some insects' body liquids actually freeze as a coping mechanism? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they've um, they've got a natural antifreeze um, uh, in 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 their version of what insects have as blood. Um, yeah, which stops the it stops the cells from you know when you put something in the freezer and it's got a lot of water in it and it it just explodes because the ice actually expands when it freezes. Uh, well, that was what would happen to an insect if it froze without this special antifreeze, and it it would just it, the cells would just burst. So yeah, they've oh. got this special chemical. Brilliant. So is that is that just some insects or most of them or just, um, the, one? just the ones that are adapted to overwinter? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's incredible. It, yeah, nature's brilliant. I mean, every every day's a school day. That's what I was just learning. So um, <laughs> yeah, so that's something you could do quite simply. Um, as I say, some yogurt pots, whatever you've got lying around the house, and just put those in the bottom of a bush or any kind of outdoor space. And the final one I wanted to speak to you about. It was something that we've been working on quite a lot recently. And this was started when one of our participants recently, who lives not so far from us, um, had the door removed and because it was all wooden and rotten. And underneath the doorstep was a family of 18 newts that had come out of the pond oh. and had um, decided to overwinter in their doorstep. So literally wildlife on your doorstep. So what we've what we made on on sessions there was something. It sounds really swanky. It's called a hibernaculum. It's a very posh word to say. Basically, it's a hole in the ground um, that we fill with stones and rocks and various um, logs, and then you have sm three or four small tubes, um, either kind of plastic drain pipes or, or kind of perforated plastic pipes. Um, and basically it's a nice little hole in the ground, covered in soil, and it's somewhere for our reptiles and our amphibians to overwinter under the frost layer. Did you think, guys, if you're going to think about making any of these things, with the with the pipes for the hibernacula, what you need to do is to give them a good scratch with um, some sandpaper or something like that, just to kind of give them some purchase so they can, it doesn't end up being like a trap, they can, they can, they can make their way um, back out there. But if anything to do with the kind of hibernation activities of it is of interest, um, just let us know and I can send James some um, some kind of fact sheets and various things that you can distribute. So as I say, each week we do various activities um, that are linked to those kind of five 
those five ways. So um, what I'll do next is I'll hand back over to Adam for a little activity. And then for the end of the session, guys, I'd just like to kind of pick your brains a little bit about how how you, it's a learning experience for us as well, how you guys engage with nature and how you think um, we might be able to um, help with that. So um, maybe that last, last sort of five or 10 minutes, we can have a bit of a, a group discussion about your feelings towards the natural world and um, how we can help engage with it. So um, Adam, if I hand back over to yourself. Yeah, brilliant. Um... Yeah, that, that hibernate, uh, hibernation session um, is one I'm going to steal very soon. I think, Mike, I've not, uh, not gone out to doing that one yet, but it's, it's a really good really good little session by the sounds of it. Um, so what I thought we could do is, um, in terms of, of activities um, that I think would be uh, easy to get into and suitable and hopefully get our kind of creative juices flowing, will be to think about maybe, let's see if we can do some poetry, uh, but specifically... A haiku. Well, has anybody heard or know what a haiku is? No. no. Right. Okay. So this is a a, a, a quite a, a special specific type of Japanese poetry. Now this isn't. It's not like we you know we're sat in some kind of Oxford college and we're you know we're going to be discussing really kind of rare forms of poetry. It's very very easy to do actually a haiku. Essentially, it's three lines, and it's made up of a total of seventeen syllables. So the first line is five syllables long. The second line is seven syllables long. And the third line is five syllables long. So that's 17 syllables split up into a pattern of five, seven, five. And traditionally, so this is kind of, you know, 18th, 19th century Japanese poetry. Traditionally, it will be nature uh, themed. So they would love to write this haiku all about nature and how nature kind of inspires them to write and things that they've noticed when they've been on nature walks or things living in their village. Um, there's a very a famous um, one by a, a Japanese poet called Basho. Um, and it is about a pond and a frog. And it's basically, this is the pattern. An old silent pond, a frog jumps into the pond, splash silence again so if you notice there's a little pattern there to that haiku it's a five syllables and then seven syllables and then five syllables a couple of other examples just, could you explain to me what a syllable is i mean thick yeah syllable so when you, you break up a word into the different different sections so uh mike your name is one syllable mike my name is two syllables adam james james is a, a, a fairly long name but james is one syllable Brian, your name, Brian, is two syllables long. I am. Yep. So that's it. So it's just, it's, it's where the word is broken up into the different sounds. Um, so laptop would be two syllables. Caterpillar. Yeah, caterpillar. Yeah, cat, caterpillar, four syllables long. Yeah. Okay. Does this, that is challenge, this, is, this is a challenge to get seven. Oh, the pressure. <laughs> Uh, Seven syllables, though. It's, you know, it doesn't have to be one word. It's you know, it's, it's three three sentences uh, made up of, a, of five syllables and then seven syllables and then five syllables. Uh, yeah. So another example, just to kind of help get the kind of the format right. Um, this one is about butterflies. So butterflies are cool. In the big, huge green forest, they fly up so high. So the first line there. Butterflies are cool, is five syllables. In the big, huge green forest is seven syllables. And they fly up so high is five syllables. And that is what a Japanese haiku is. So I thought I'd give you guys a little bit of a, uh, a creative writing challenge, if you can, is to come up with your own haikus, or maybe we can think about some themes, some nature themes that we could write haikus about. Let's say you've got a favourite animal or a favourite place to go to um, or a favourite country or something like that with, you know, like the Amazon or African savanna or jungle or whatever. Uh, and we could maybe try and write a haiku together if you uh, if you want to. But it's, just, it's a nice little simple way of having to go at creative writing, but about the natural world. No, I so, every day. <laughs> so on, Brian, what was that? I said you learn something every day. <laughs> Uh, there are uh, one of my, one of our colleagues uh, cycles to work uh, quite frequently. She, this, this has inspired me uh, 
to do this and she wrote a haiku she thought about it while she was cycling to work one morning it just popped into her head um, and she wrote one about um why you know why she cycles to work um, and it was a way of getting away from the traffic and the cars and to be able to cycle in the dark through the trees along cycle paths yeah it's really nice well should we challenge adam by giving him some some random words and he can do it for us yeah, I could start off. I, I, I did actually write one uh, while Mike was doing his little uh, intro. Um, so I'm going to see. I wrote it at the bottom of my little thingy here. There we go. So this is my one that I just wrote a little bit earlier on. The water ripples, a bright needle emerges, dragonfly is born. Okay. <laughs> and that's uh, that's about dragonflies. Obviously, when they're um, when they're young insects, larvae, they live. In, underwater in ponds there's dragonfly nymphs and then when they're ready to emerge as adults they crawl up a a, a rush or a reed or a blade of grass in a pond and they crawl up onto the onto that leaf and then they fix there and their final kind of in larval skin splits and they and the dragonfly the adult dragonfly emerges out of that skin as a as an adult dragonfly. Um, so I was just kind of writing a little haiku about uh, a dragonfly emerging from the water. Is that a five on mud pecker pex tree? Yep, brilliant. Five, Wood pecker pex tree. So that's your that's your first line of your haiku. So does anybody have any suggestions about how you can write the next line? So this could be a group haiku. I like it, Brian. Good start. His head banged against the tree rapidly. Is that five? Is that seven or is that eight? <laughs> its head bangs against a tree rapidly. Yeah, uh, rapidly would be rapidly is three, so that, that oh, yeah. takes it up to ten. But uh, head bang rapid. head bangs rapid. against tree. Rapid. Yeah, quickly. Yeah. Uh, quickly, yeah. Yep. Head bangs against tree quickly. So that's your. That's your second line, guys. We've only got five more syllables to go. Yeah. And it fits in well with the woodpecker in the in the sound clip before. I like it. Yep, exactly. I like this one. And no headache yet. <laughs> and no headache yet. Pa absolutely perfect. I was thinking get by the There we go, guys. I, I'm not sure whether you've done this before, but you have all written your first haiku. Never done it before. That's my first. Oh, I'll read that out again. That's woodpecker pecks tree, head bangs against tree quickly, and no headache yet. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> cool. So there you go. So hopefully that's set your, your mind thinking. You can think about haikus all day now. <laughs> Start composing them about making cups of tea or going to the loo or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be doing that tonight, I bet. Yeah. So there you go. I wake up at two in the morning, Brian, or something like that. I've got one. I've got one. That <laughs> <laughs> keeps your brain active, doesn't it? I'm just learning yep. guitar at the minute. And that, because I, I went into a coma in 2008 and I ended up with brain damage. And I've started learning guitar in last year. And my memory is coming back a bit better each time. So it all works, doesn't it? Using your brain. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is the the beauty of the kind of our sessions as well is that it, it we try and incorporate like lots of different things into our sessions um, as a way of you know learning and keeping active. But just yeah, just in, just a, a gentle mental boost. Right, yeah. right. we we take dog every morning, early morning round Burton Park in Wales, and uh, we do we do about four or five miles each morning with dog, right through woods and everything, and we often hear woodpecker on park. Like we did in that before, and that that music, uh, them bird songs, and that you sang uh, played before. I have a uh, Alexa, and it's uh, sleep sounds, and I play forest birds and all that each night, and thunderstorms and all sorts, but to go to sleep to. Mm. Yeah, it's lovely. It's relaxing though, because you can sort of visualise like a meadow or a like say the woodland and, and things like that so you kind of visualize it so you're seeing it in your in your mind but you're also like mike said smelling it and to a certain degree maybe tasting it in, in uh, things as well 
Oh yeah, I I love going to sleep, to sleep, so I see into birds and stuff. There's a great a few YouTube channels that have that kind of thing on. If you subscribe to them, they've got lots of list videos of of different background sounds, like you know, kind of a woodland cabin with the rain outside or crackling fire in a library or something like that. Yeah, they're they're yeah, really nice to have as background. And there's, yeah. there's one of the videos I did back in, I think it's beginning of June. Got up at four o'clock and I went down to the to the lodges, Mike, and and just, just filmed the dawn chorus because um, a, a lot of people are still in bed at that time in the morning. So I thought I'll go and film it. Then people can appreciate sort of how loud it is and, and what what's going on at that time in the morning. I remember you playing me that one. It was brilliant. Um, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, so those um, those clips that I played, there's lots of them. Um, they were just there's loads out there. They were just taken from um, Springwatch sites, actually. Um, but I think it does. Um, it's quite funny how that sound and that it can take you on a little journey. It's like it just takes you somewhere else. As I say, as it was happening, I could feel my, my shoulders dropping and just feeling more relaxed. Especially yeah, when you when you kind of um, I mean, for me and Adam, this is this feels really artificial because we're used to being out in the mud, and we've we've had to develop very very quickly. But at the same time, I think the pandemic has proven um, more of a need for our service more more than ever, where people are really struggling, not being able to get out of the house. And as I say, sometimes the activity itself isn't isn't particularly that important, um, whether it be creative or whatever. The the most important thing is actually. Um, chatting about the natural world and the most important thing above that is actually connecting with other people and kind of sharing sharing those things and um, realizing you're not on your own with these with these feelings or any kind of you know any kind of highlights it's, it's um yeah it's really interesting to hear you guys um, and how you connect with with nature it was good this morning when I was when I was out doing the the video for the for the cycling that we were doing and we, we stopped at one point and the guy that I was with was saying he stopped and he said just stop here because there's there's three deer and it was just out of my range of vision but the way he described it you know you could see it with the white tails and, and things like that uh, and it's I could see something move but I couldn't have told I wouldn't have been able to tell you what it was until it said you know there was three deer there and it's just things like that it sort of lifted your lifted your mood up it's it was peeing it down with rain early on this morning but um just lifted your mood, knowing that there's there was the deer there, and you'd seen the deer and um, all all the other um, smells and and sounds that you were were about. We we was on Murden Park this morning, and there were so much squirrels out, and they're starting to get white on the chest and that. Now I say, for winter in it, don't they change colour a bit for winter? They, they definitely get chunkier. Yeah, I've seen a couple with white chests. Yeah, there was somebody like, they have like white chest on, it's like white fur on the chest, you said. Uh-uh. Maybe they're just getting old. Yeah, probably. That's how I say it needs changing. But yeah, it just it just shows that when you we are out and about on the walks and, and things like that, the, there's a lot of things that we maybe don't see but we we're here so we'll be, we'll be out walking on the moors in spring and you'll hear a cuckoo sort of in the distance uh, and I've, I've done this many a time where i've either been out with with jane or been out with mum and dad and i've heard the cuckoo and i said just stop a minute i can hear a cuckoo and said no it's not so they just start for a while and listen and then they're able to hear it it's just you, you sort of learn to use all your other ex, um all your other senses a bit more yeah so. I think um, there's like kind of it takes the practice here, you know, kind of sort of even like mindful walking and even walking over different textures. So a really good example would be at the moment, you know, if you get a nice heavy frost, walking across that field um, or and hearing the crunch of the um, the frost under your feet, or when you're moving from grass to gravel to pavement. Um, and actually kind of focusing on that movement and in that in that moment you're not worried about everything else so you can there's lots of different things that you can that you can do to kind of help slow the brain down um two things i like with that mike is um when you get the fresh deep snow and you hear that creaking 
noise that it makes when you walk yeah. over it. And also dried leaves in autumn when you walk yeah. over it, dried leaves yeah. and all the crunches and <laughs> I love that squeak. I love that squeak that snow makes. It's, it's almost yes, yeah, it's, it's a crunch, almost a squeak, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it's really nice. I like the um, I like the yeah. feeling of uh, of going over a frosty field. Your footsteps feel thick, like you're like you're stepping into a marshmallow. I really like that feeling. <laughs> yeah, we once once went on a an overnight bushcraft. Uh, it was one February up in in Coniston, um, so we were camping out. We'd done a canoe trip. And the following morning, we were doing a, a canoe trip across to Peel Island. And it was overnight, it had been like minus 10, and it was really cold. Oh, so everything was frozen, the lake. And as we're paddling the canoes, we're breaking the ice. And you were picking chunks of ice up and throwing it along the top of the ice. And the noise that made, it was like an electronic yeah, sound like, as it's going. You can hear it skipping across the lake. and It's like, whir it's like a whirring, isn't it? It is, yeah. It's, it's almost like an electronic sound than, than anything else. But a guy, on, oh, a guy on TV the other day, uh, I think it could have been country found, I don't know what we're watching. He said, if you go to a tree in the beginning of spring and put your ear to the trunk, you can actually hear the tree growing and the water going from the bottom to the top. You can hear it. In, uh, first, at uh, beginning of spring. Yeah, I saw something about that. He developed a little. Someone had developed a little gizmo with like a stethoscope yeah. that and could they, pick up the sound of the yeah, water moving underneath this yeah. bark. Yeah. yeah, it's brilliant, that's, though, isn't it? That's really cool. Um, right. Well, as I'm, I need to dash as I need to go and pick the kids up from school um, fairly soon. Yeah. Um, has anyone got any questions at all about um, about? My place project, or um, no, I, I already do a few things like uh, we planted a pear tree, apple tree, cherry tree, and we leave fruit on floor wherever falls, and we leave bits on tree for birds and stuff. And I leave planks of wood and everything about garden for things to live under. There's bits of all sorts about, so and I've got an old bath which is boarded all around front and sides, but not the back, and it's up against the fence, so anything can get behind it to live if it wants to eat winter. So, <laughs> there's all sorts of live behind it. <laughs> Dare I say a hybrid bath, Yeah, 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 it's like an application <laughs> for a bath. <laughs> Yeah. So if, if anybody fancies getting involved with the, the My Place, then how do we, what do we do referral-wise? Do we just get in touch with you guys or...? Yeah, people yeah, can, um, you can, people can self-refer just off our website. There's a link off our social medias or um, off websites and it's just a simple self-referral form. Right. Um, or... Is it an ongoing thing or is it a, like a, a six-week course or...? No, I mean, people tend to... Um, sort of spend three, three to six months with us usually. Um, yeah. And then obviously, um, just to put, depending on what level of support. So the only slight hiccup at the moment is obviously, um, it's not a hiccup as such, but we're quite limited to to numbers with, yeah. with outdoor sessions. So we, current, we can't currently have more than four people on session with a staff member and a volunteer because of the current guidelines. Um, but certainly, um, there's no issue with space on on the online sessions, um, and it, yeah, I think we just need to have a conversation, James, about how we can link in my place in Galloway's um, more in the future. I know there's some talk about um, you guys maybe doing some training for us, as, for our staff members as well, about how could, we can be more inclusive to help you help, you know, visually impaired um, guys like yourselves engage more with our activities and whether. It's um, bespoke sessions for, for you guys or regular sessions. I don't know. Um, there's we, lots, we of, did, lots of ideas. We did a bit of weaving at, at galleries. Like at Christmas time, we're making them things like you hang on your door. Right. We, yeah. we, we did a bit of weaving then. That were good. Yeah, this is what I did last week. Um, the texture of it, it's willow and dogwood. I was getting some strange looks when I was doing that. Um, so, yeah, if you, 
I mean, what well, we, we have done in the what we have done in the past, and it's it's a while ago. We got involved. I think it was with Lancashire Wildlife Trust, um, and we did some environment work. So we sort of balsam bashing and oh. rhododendron clearing and things like that. So if there's hmm. if there's anything sort of when you get into spring or whenever you do that sort of work on any of the reserves, if there's if there's something that may fit in. Uh, I'm sure some of our guys would like to to come along and help practical. and get involved. Yeah, bro. Um, are you are you guys most, mostly all kind of Preston, Leyland, Chorley area? Uh, we've we've got people from all over, but if we if we were coming uh, under normal, I say under normal lockdown rules, uh, not lockdown rules, under normal conditions, uh, we have got minibus, uh, and if people are coming from like Lancaster and Morecambe, they would either use their minibus to come down. Uh, and then we'd meet at a set place or yeah. some people might come and get to to Preston on the train and then we'll pick them up at the, the train station so um, yeah. getting place I mean we've we've been to um, Pleasington before is that one of your sites the Warm Garden of Pleasington no I, I don't think so no right so uh, we've work there we've we've done um, we've done some work at um Mia Sands, I think we've done some work there before. Yeah, I remember you've, you used that as a walk site as well, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, if there's, there's anything that you, you need to do in that way, then I'm sure Brilliant. I'd like to come along and have a day out and get involved. And, and like I say, I think Adam mentioned it in those five principles was giving something back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Very good. Um, so I think... Um, yeah, I'll, I'll speak to you, James, and uh, see if we can get some um, some promotion of you guys and some uh, we put some links on both of our sites and see if that will that will help. Um, and yeah, definitely we'll be able to sort of some practical stuff when we're allowed. We might even be able to give you a cup of tea by then. We'll just work you hard. <laughs> get the old Kelly kettle going. Is that you use that? Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, none of this pre-boiled nonsense now. We might, well, I certainly do make my brews fresh. Yeah, def definitely. <laughs> Brill. Well, thanks for the thanks for the invite, guys, and I hope yeah, you found it you. Uh, uh, interesting. And um, yeah, yeah. No problem. Sure. thanks for coming along. And like I say, maybe another time we can get you on, and we'll do a you know maybe do some some session, whether it was I don't know bird identification or or whatever. Yeah through sounds and things like that that might be something that might be of interest yeah that'd be cool i'll say today was just trying to give a kind of very broad overview of what we're up to and uh, the kind of background of the project really so yeah definitely sort something out james yeah and our website is there for more information you know 24 7 um yeah just lancashire wildlife trust my place project so that's you can always have a look for more info there there's contact information for mm -hmm. us and that self-referral form as well um, oh, I've just noticed there was a couple of uh, chat messages there. I think Adam's mentioned about what do what do robins like to eat. Um, yeah, Denise asked, I think, before she lost her con. Her one of the connection. things you put down is mealworms. Now, I've heard that a lot of times. Um, when I put mealworms out at our house, it seems to be the starlings and the sparrows that go through them, and the, the robin <laughs> ignores them. Right, so, okay, <laughs> there you go. Um, I've, I've put some mealworms on the, the bird table at the bottom um, and I think the, the great tits and things like that were, were going for them but the robins seem to totally ignore them and just, go, so... for, just go for the seeds so. uh -huh, Right, okay, <laughs> um, there you go I'll add that to my, uh, to my knowledge, thank you but, uh, they're, they're fickle, these birds <laughs> So, and Mike says you tell, father, tell them that the robins are Father Christmas Spies. It's all I tell my kids. I keep it nature themed. So <laughs> I say uh, the robins spy on them to make sure they're behaving themselves. Uh, I'll have to use that one with Cara next time she comes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thanks a lot, guys, for for coming along. Uh, and like I say, hopefully we can get you on another time, and we'll we'll see what else we can do, and maybe work with you in the future. Well, that'd be good. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you Thanks very guys. much, guys. Nice to meet you all. Thank you very much.